When I was 10, I had a Lador Vador moment. Following in the footsteps of my parents and sisters and generations before me, I got my first pair of glasses. <laughs> and since then, I have worn glasses and contacts every day of my life, and I've been able to see pretty well. But now I'm at that age. With glasses, my distance vision was fine, but reading became an athletic pursuit. I would pull my glasses off and shove a book under my nose, or I'd kind of keep them on and see how far I could reach. Uh, and so my doctor told me, it is time. <laughs> Progressives. And the new lenses are amazing. It took me about a day to get used to them, but now I can see quite clearly what's out in the distance, and I can also comfortably sit and read a book. And the use of lenses dates back to ancient times. The Romans used lenses as burning glasses, where a piece of glass was used to reflect light in order to ignite a piece of paper or kindling. And between the 11th and 13th centuries, there were these things called reading stones that were created from cutting a glass sphere in half, and they were used by monks to assist in illuminating small manuscripts. By the middle of the 13th century, an unknown inventor in Pisa fashioned the first set of eyeglasses. And on this day, this very day in 1608, Dutch eyeglass and spectacle maker Hans Lippersche applied for a patent for an instrument designed for seeing things far away as if they were nearby. The next year, Galileo took the Dutch design and refined it to create a leaden tube with a convex objective lens in one end and a concave eyepiece in the other. And pointing his lenses toward the stars, it came to be known as the Galilean telescope, from the Greek meaning far-seeing. He had no idea. On Christmas Day in 2021, the $10 billion James Webb Telescope was launched into space. It took about 30 days to travel nearly a million miles to its permanent home, a stable location in space where it orbits the sun while constantly staying in direct line with the Earth. And after testing all its components and instruments, the first images came back. And there appeared to be smudges all over the images. And then they looked a little more carefully and they saw that all of those smudges were galaxies. It's an emotional moment when you see nature suddenly releasing some of its secrets, said Thomas Zerbichin, who's the associate administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate. It's not an image, it's a worldview. We call this day by many names, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Hazikaron, the Day of Remembrances, but the rabbis also called it Yom Harat Olam, the day of the universe's conception. This day asks us to take a good hard look at ourselves, at what we believe, at the lives we lead and the choices we make, but what we see when we look at ourselves and at this moment kind of depends on the lenses we choose to wear. And we need corrective lenses because humanity tends to be incredibly nearsighted, practically to the point of blindness. On any given day, we find ourselves consumed with our own individual needs and wants and desires. Our gaze hardly ever looks past our immediate surroundings. We grow obsessed with our looks, with our weight, our reputation, what's in fashion. We think about ourselves and our household, our jobs and careers, our kids and our kids and our kids and our kids. <laughs> and most of the time, it's hard to think about anything more than how to get through the day. And we get even more myopic when we're in pain. Raise your hand if you've ever thrown out your back. You can't think of anything else, right? You may be sitting at a meeting or out with friends and all you're thinking is if I just shift a little, maybe that pain will go away. And spiritual pain works exactly the same way. It makes us myopic. When we're lonely or hurt or afraid, our sense of brokenheartedness makes it almost impossible to see anything or anyone else. When we fall into black holes of despair or rage or resentment, our myopia grows even narrower. And that myopia, uncorrected, can lead to fanaticism. 
a maniacal preoccupation with one's own narrative and perception of the truth. Now, I'm not talking about fanatics that you see at a European soccer match or at a baseball stadium. I'm talking about fanatics with much more dangerous aims. Philosopher Ruth Chechen writes, in their struggle for what they take to be good against what they take to be evil, the fanatical group is willing to sacrifice their own or others' well-being or even lives. On October 7th of last year, thousands of radical Hamas militants stormed over the Gaza border into Israel. In their rampage, as we know, they massacred thousands, burned families alive, butchered men, women, and children, and laughed as they committed the most inhuman of atrocities and kidnapped more than 250 people as their hostages, including infant children and the elderly. Why? What could possibly have inspired such vicious acts of murderous hate? Fanaticism. The same fanaticism that drives the menace of Hezbollah, the Houthis and Iran, the infantile fanatical belief that Allah, the master of the universe, has decreed that that little land, the land of Palestine, is an Islamic waqf, a holy possession, consecrated for future Muslim generations until Judgment Day. The myopic fanaticism that is responsible for the deaths of thousands of people across decades of suffering, a maniacal belief that to serve God, I must supplant or destroy the other. And this fanatical thinking is as myopic as it is evil. And our tradition has something to say about the evil of fanaticism. As Rabbi Haas taught us earlier, the Torah portion we read today, we meet another fanatic, Abraham. And the Torah teaches that he grows to be so fanatically consumed with his devotion to God that he has discovered that he hears God command him, take his son, his only son, whom he loves, Isaac, and to offer him up as a burnt offering. And Abraham not only agrees, but he embraces his mission with fanatical devotion. He gets up early in the morning, he saddles his donkey, he splits the wood, he sets off with two young men and his son Isaac. And as Rabbi Haas taught us, he's so fanatically focused on what he's doing, he doesn't even talk for three days. When Abraham reached the top of the mountain, he built an altar and he bound his son and he laid him on top of the wood and his hand reached out to take the knife. And then an angel, thank God, an angel of God calls out to him, Abraham, Abraham, don't raise your hand against the boy. Don't do anything to him. And Abraham lifted his eyes and behold, there was a ram caught in the thickets by his horns and Abraham sacrificed the ram instead of his son. Now, some traditions offer this story as a celebration of Abraham's devotion to God. Look how pious he is. Look how strong his faith. He would even sacrifice his own son. But others read this story as a rebuke of Abraham's fanaticism. Sephardic congregations in their worship include a 12th century poem from Rabbi Yehuda ben Shmuel ibn Abbas. The poem suggests that it is Abraham's myopia that blinds him even to his own son and the teachings of his own tradition. In the poem, knowing he is destined for sacrifice, Isaac asks his father, where is the land as the halakha demands? Have you forgotten your religion? What is demanded and desired of us, the Torah teaches, is not blind fanatical devotion to our warped interpretation of what we imagine that God demands. Instead, Torah teaches us to look up from our fanatical myopia and to see the world as God sees it. So let's do that, okay? Let's take a look at our world through the lenses of the creator of the universe. Thanks to the Webb telescope, we now understand that somewhere between 13 and maybe even 26 billion years ago, from a single point in space, there erupted a massive surge of energy. And as the universe expanded, it formed the creation of somewhere around 200 billion galaxies. And each of those galaxies is comprised of somewhere around 100 billion stars. There are actually more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the seashores of Earth. And coming in closer, we approach a spiral galaxy that we call the Milky Way. And on one arm of that spiral galaxy is a fairly average, ordinary star we call the Sun. 
And the third planet orbiting that star, a magnificent blue orb floating in space, is just the right size, just the right mineral content, and just the right distance from that right size star that the average temperature here is somewhere between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, which is like this narrow, which allows there to be liquid water, which allows this utterly rare thing called life. And beneath the swirl of clouds, we marvel at the wild biodiversity of trees and plants and flowers and grasses and all that grows from the earth. See the extraordinary array of creatures who live in the seas, the birds who take wing to soar through the skies and the animals who creep and gallop and roam across the land. Peering through God's lenses at all the infinite variety of flowers, is one superior to another? among the fascinating varieties of cats, dogs, bears, bees, bugs, and birds. Can we judge one to be better? We would see why God simply calls them good. And then with God's lenses, maybe we look at ourselves, this wondrous, extraordinary creature we call human. How must God marvel at us, this brand new creature, on a planet that's like 4.6 billion years old, humanity only came around 100,000 years ago. And only in the last 6,000 years have we figured out how to live in civilization. Humanity comes in so many glorious colors, with dark skin and tan skin and light skin, with blonde hair and black hair and red hair and afro and curly and wavy and fine and bald. We clothe ourselves in innumerable different fabrics and fashions. We speak to each other in over 7,100 different languages. We write stories and poetry. We make sculpture and art. We design instruments and lift our voices to create symphonies of soaring melody, harmony, rhythm, and sound. We invent ever more extraordinary machines that connect people to knowledge and each other with ever greater power and speed. We construct all manner of buildings in which we live and work and gather and learn in quiet spaces to explore our inner self. We fashion machines that can travel the globe and that can even slip the surly bonds of earth. We make medicines to heal ourselves from injury and disease and to extend the quality of the time that we may have. And yet, we are so devastatingly myopic and narrow-minded. With fanatical arrogance and ignorance, we wantonly destroy our home, the only planet on which we can live, ignoring the needs and plight of those with whom we share our world and those who will inhabit this earth long after our generation is gone. We wage war over arbitrary borderlines on maps we draw. We persecute and oppress others based on the most inane factors where someone was born or what language they speak, or what gender they are, or what color their skin, or what religion they profess, or whom they choose to love. We murder, we rape, we steal, we lie. We are maddeningly oblivious to our shared destiny with all else that lives. We are selfish and myopic. We're ridiculous. How absurd, how blind. Do we really suppose that the master of a universe billions of years old with 200 billion galaxies and trillions of stars actually has a preference for which followers of which religion occupy this tiny sliver of land on this particular planet? What kind of infantile belief teaches that the master of the universe desires someone to massacre or torture or burn or rape those who don't belong to their people? It's insane, and it doesn't have to be this way. It shouldn't be this way. Humanity is too smart, too sophisticated, too well equipped with the capacity for understanding, for wisdom and awareness. We don't need to be blinded by ancient superstition. We don't have to prance around our planet like fools, our eyes smugly closed with arrogance and ignorance. We don't have to focus on all the wrong things. The Jewish people are not precious because God prefers us to any others. How ridiculous and offensive a notion. 
The Jewish people are precious because what we teach. Because ours is a tradition that endeavors to teach us how to transcend our petty human myopia and see the world through God's lenses. If you use God's lenses, then you will see that the same energy that spawned our incomprehensibly vast universe is the same energy that formed our sun, our world, and all that exists, all that lives, you and me. Abraham may have seen himself as but dust and ashes, but the Mishnah teaches us that every single human being is unique and holy and infinitely precious. God's lenses let us see how to balance the love for ourselves with a responsibility for all creation, how to cherish life but to appreciate death, how to pursue paths that propel us forward to progress while inspiring us to awe and wonder and gratitude, how to balance the pursuit of justice with compassion and loving kindness, how to champion the cause of the vulnerable and the weak to lift up the downtrodden and the powerless, God's lenses open our eyes even wider to understanding, to awareness, and perhaps maybe even to wisdom. How to love and how to live. Walt Whitman wrote in 1877 in his magnificent essay, Democratic Vistas, there is in sanest hours a consciousness, a thought that rises independent, lifted out from all else, calm like the stars shining eternal. And this is the thought of identity, yours for you, mine for me, whoever you are and as I am. Miracle of miracles beyond statement, most spiritual and vaguest of earth's dreams, yet hardest basic fact and only entrance to all facts in such devout hours in the midst of the significant wonders of heaven and earth significant only because of the me in the center. Creeds, conventions fall away and become of no account before this simple idea. Under the luminousness of real vision, it alone takes possession, takes value. It expands over the whole earth and spreads to the roof of heaven. In this new year, let's rid ourselves of our maniacal fanaticisms Let's move past our nearsighted conceit and our myopic self-concern and instead choose a new vision, one that, as Rabbi Sam Feinsmith writes, might ferry us across the chasm to a new, more healing, embodied, sustainable, expansive, embracing, and humane way of being Jewish, one that clarifies our deepest, most timeless values and isn't afraid to shed outer forms that no longer serve us. One that points away from the notion of the Jewish people as a nation that stands alone and points instead toward a vision of Judaism that celebrates mutuality, interdependence, and kinship with all life on earth. Maybe then, perhaps, we will have found a way to attune ourselves to the frequency on which God's energy passes through the universe and begin to transform our lives and our world so that we can truly maximize the experience of this fraction of a moment that we get to be human. As the psalmist writes, Esa enai el hehari me'ayin yavo ezri, ezri me'im adonai ose shemayim va'aretz. I lift my eyes to the mountain. From where will my help come? My help comes from the eternal, the maker of heaven and earth.